Welcome to Living Liberty. I'm your host, Shannon Stallings, and today we're going to be talking about a medicine that has been patented by the United States government in 2003. In the patent abstract, they describe this medicine as being used to treat neurological damage from strokes and trauma, as well as treating neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia, and HIV AIDS. So what is this miracle drug? Marijuana, of course. We are fortunate today to have three wonderful guests. The first is named Annalisa Clark. She is a Canna mom whose 10-year-old daughter has been experiencing a severe form of epilepsy that can be remedied with medical cannabis. We're also fortunate to have Bill Wolsifer, who is running for Florida State Attorney General, as well as Josephine Krell, a licensed clinical social worker who works in the hospice field. We're here with Annalisa Clark on Skype. Ms. Clark, you are an insurance professional with a 10-year-old daughter from Jacksonville, Florida. Can you tell me how exactly you became a, an advocate for medical cannabis? Yes, I sure can. Uh, basically, my, I have a daughter with intractable seizures. She just turned 10 this month, and she started having seizures at three months old. And I was posting on her lack of progress, in fact, on how bad she was doing, and lots of people started to send me information on medical marijuana from other states. So could you tell me a little bit about your daughter's condition? What exactly um, are the symptoms of that? She actually um, started having seizures at three months, and they did a barrage of tests and couldn't find really anything. So they just started putting her on medications to see if the seizures would stop. And by the time she was six months, she was on four different medications, two of which are not even approved for 12-year-olds. So being six months old, I can only imagine what they were doing to her. So um, by the time she was 11 months, she had manifested her second seizure type. And uh, by the time she was, oh, I think two years old, we'd gone through three or four different seizure types, and I don't can't, I lost track on how many medicines that she had at that point. So how frequently was she having seizures? In the beginning, she only had them when she was going to sleep, and that's how we noticed them. She was going to sleep, and they were in there. And then when she was six months old, uh, and they had her on all the medicines, she was just having them all day long. And by the time she was 11 months old, um, she was probably having 90 to 110 a day. Oh, my gosh. So, um, and we, we started her on a, diet, a ketogenic diet at 15 months, and she went from 90 seizures to 10, okay. which was thrilling, but it didn't last, and they all started to come back again. And has it improved? With She's 10 years old now, is that right? Yes. So, our path in the last 10 years is she has been ex um, on 16 different drugs, which um, is a thousand different side effects when I added them up. I did that before I went to testify to the Senate subcommittee. Um, I went in and, and that was kind of scary. I had never done that before. And I pulled up every medicine and added them up. And I, I think she probably experienced 200 of them herself that I noticed on the list. Um, but we tried three different diets. We did a vagal nerve stimulator, which is a computer chip that they put in the chest and they wrap little wires around the vagal nerve trying to intercept seizures, which mm -hmm. worked a little bit for not, for in the diets a little bit, but not long lasting. Uh, we went to three different countries for stem cells, which showed huge improvement. The problem is we don't do stem cells in our country. They were adult stem cells, not embryonic, but we don't even do that here. So I couldn't afford to keep going back to China and Germany, which is where we had the most success. Uh, from there, we went to the brain surgery path because we were told that there was no hope uh, and there were no other options for us, that we had exhausted everything. So she had a series of three brain surgeries beginning two years ago, and those were semi-successful. Even though she was still seizing, she was actually having cognitive, cognitive development. So um, the third brain surgery was a failure. She seized the day we got out, and it left her handicapped and unable to walk or use her uh, left side again. So last year, she, uh, after one more seizure, she started to go down. She actually recovered a little bit from the brain surgery, and then she, we tried one more drug, and that really took her down downhill fast. So last year, we had to add a feeding tube. We had to have hip surgery to put her pins back in place from all the seizures, um, popping her hips out, and uh, that kind of brought us where we were last year. 
Well, how did you arrive then at the decision? How did medical cannabis come into it? How did you find out about that? Yeah, so, so some of the, um, if you take a look at what she looked like last year, mm -hmm. um, in some of the pictures I sent you, she actually was pretty bad. So people started to send me articles and links about Colorado and what they were doing out there. So I called out to Colorado and was ready to move. And there was, because of the popularity of the CNN shows, there, they were on a five month waiting list. And I didn't know there was, I didn't know that there were plants everywhere. I really thought maybe there was only one place. Mm -hmm. So I thought five months, you know, they wanted me to move out there and wait for five months. So I, I thought I'm not doing that. And I waited a couple months and she got worse. And so by Christmas of last year, she was really bad. And I called back and they said, well now we're on a 11 month waiting list. Oh, nice. So you can come and move your family here and wait 11 months before you'll see medicine. And I didn't want to do that. So somebody actually sent me something. I just said, can you just go check it out? And, and we started her on cannabis in January just because we couldn't stand seeing how far she was going downhill. And within five days on cannabis, she was sitting up again and she was able to chew and swallow food. She had lost the ability to, to chew, swallow. All her basic functions had stopped. She wasn't urinating or having any VMs. Nothing was working anymore. So within 10 days, she was starting to take small bites. Wow. She could sit up. Uh, 20 days, she's on the floor playing. 30 days, she's, eat, she's feeding herself and sleeping all night and all the, the bodily functions were coming back. The cognition was great. It's definitely not the magic bullet. Right. She did still have seizures. She went 30 days and then had some seizures and then made it 60 days and we had one. Uh, and then we had to do the hip surgery. So that really set her back. And uh, we kind of brings me where we are today in that what I realized is that there are specific strains that help these kids and you just can't go down the street and take any plant and it it's a miraculous cure. It doesn't quite work like that. Okay, so that brings me to this bill that has passed in the Florida legislature. There's Senate Bill 1040. That's known as the Compassionate Use Act. Is that something that will help you? Are there limitations on that bill? Well, Senate Bill 1030 is a, um, it's very interesting. And I went over and I was, I, I've been at every hearing in Tallahassee and um, it, it is, it's only one particular uh, profile and it's very limited and so knowing what I've been through she's we've tried seven seven different strains for her mm -hmm. and there are times where they ha you have to alter the, alternate and mix them up so I really um, I don't know that I think it'll what will help her is that we don't have CBD plants growing in Florida now I mean no one has an interest in that because you don't there's no psychoactive benefit out of that. So of course, you know, there is none of that here. And so having it here and having it regulated and having uh, the four, you know, someone there, I think is huge. I'm really excited about that. Mm -hmm. I just don't think that, I think people are gonna be disappointed that it wasn't the magic bullet. I think a lot of people are hoping it's, it is, as was I. I was hoping that one thing would work and I have discovered that it isn't that easy. Okay, so you kind of have to, like one strain may work and another may not. So is this mm -hmm. law, is Senate Bill 1040 limited um, to one particular strain then? Yeah, it's one profile. So it, it, it has to be less than 0.8 THC and, uh, and over 10% CBD. And so we have to supplement. Um, she has spasticity problems. She has eating problems. So the THC, I believe, is what really helped helped with those things because she actually had a little bit of both but okay. she definitely the high cbd is the key to a lot of the neurodegenerative repairing that needs to happen with these kids okay. but i think a lot of the i think that's what's important i, I think this bill is only going to allow um that one strain and it might not be enough there's nothing you can supplement you can't tweet you can't it's like it's like if you go to the store and only tylenol is the only thing you can take and what if you can't take that okay well, what about um, Amendment 2? Will that open things up at all if it passes? No, I lost you. Oh, oh. can you see me? Um, I would, yeah. Um, go ahead. Amendment 2 is what I was asking about. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, Amendment 2 is actually, 
They I think somebody's using my internet, so I'm going to try to get them off. Okay. I think, I'm sorry. Things are slowing down. Um, so I think Amendment 2, my concern more is for the rulemaking. So regardless, whether we get Amendment 2 or we get another uh, bill gets introduced, the key is going to be the rules that are written around a an acceptable, compassionate use, medical, patient-centric program. And I don't think we have that. I'm just, you know, that's what we need with Amendment 2. Amendment 2 passing is not going to just magically fix everything. Okay. It's going to be what happens next that's going to be the key. Okay. But would Amendment 2 open up various strains, I guess, of the medical marijuana? Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. yes, yes. Okay. Yes. So that's, yes, and that's key. So it will expand the marketplace. So now not only are more illnesses, because Senate Bill 1030 is only two illnesses. So, you know, what about all the rest of the people? There's a lot of people. There's a lot of evidence coming out of the other states that multitudes of illnesses are being helped. People are coming off, getting off pain prescriptions, and pay, people are managing um, their lives without having to take all the narcotics. So those people are not included in Senate Bill 1030, and they would be under Amendment 2. So I think from, from expansion, it's, it's, it's what we need. We have to have expansion from Senate Bill 1030. That is just like a, step in, a baby step. Right. And talking about limits of the Senate bill, that bill is limited to only five providers, really, of cannabis. Correct. It is. Yes. So, so it's five. It's five providers, and um, that could make the prices really high. Yes. Okay. And in terms of availability, um, when you, you know, when your daughter needs it, you want to make sure that you have access to it. Exactly. And what if the guy in my area it doesn't have the one that fits for her? And, and again, because because you're only allowed to do certain things, we're not going to see a lot of variety. You know, so all five are going to, like, they may have different names, you know, the one might call it, you know, snazzy, whatever, and the next one will call it another name. So they'll all have, they may all have different names, but at the end of the day, they can't go outside the box very much. So we are limited to what we can try okay. by just having five. And, and the pricing, my biggest concern with five is just, there's, you know, we all know, there's no, competition helps with the pricing. Absolutely. And we need the pricing to be affordable. Most of the people who need this medicine are already at the end of the road, and they can't afford to pay. This won't be covered by insurance, and it's not, it isn't $10. It's expensive. It's been very expensive for us. All right. Well, thank you so much, Annalise, for being with us today. I really appreciate it. Okay. No problem. If you need me back, I'll be here. Okay. Thanks. Have fun uh, with your daughter. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. All right, bye. Welcome back. We are lucky to have with us this afternoon Bill Wolsefer, who is running for Florida State Attorney General, as well as Josephine Krell. She is a licensed clinical social worker. Um, she's got a lot of experience with hospice care. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you. Ms. Krell, can you tell us a little bit about how you became involved with the medical cannabis movement? Well, I first became involved um, in 2010 when uh, the Kathy Jordan bill was originally introduced mm -hmm. um, and my interest just kept getting sparked more and more. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my dad was diagnosed with uh, stage four lung cancer mm -hmm. in 2009 mm -hmm. and we went through all kinds of treatment protocols with him, um, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation and um, ultimately he died in January of this year. Mm -hmm. um, and so the more I learned about um, cannabis therapeutics, mm -hmm. the more interested I got in the subject, and the more I started researching the therapeutic values of cannabis, <clears throat> especially as it relates to end of life and um, cancer patients. Um, so in terms of end-of-life care, um, how important is cannabis in that or how, you know, in terms of having an opportunity to make a choice about the way you want to make your decisions? Well, right now amazing things are being done, um, especially in uh, Colorado, in Oregon, in California with um, 
nursing home patients and um, with cannabis therapeutics in hospice care. Mm -hmm. um, it has been shown to help reduce anxiety, um, agitation. Mm -hmm. It uh, has been shown to improve appetite, mm -hmm. um, you know, and comes into play in wasting syndrome. Um, and for me, the most important thing is patient choice. Mm -hmm. um, as a social worker, um, you know, we kind of look at the world and identify problems facing humanity mm -hmm. and try to um, improve people's lives and improve the world around us. Mm -hmm. And so I just really feel that it's important um, to offer as many choices to people as possible. Mm -hmm. And especially with a substance that there are no reported deaths by overdose. Um, in my review of all of the literature, uh, you know, the, the worst side effect that I've come across is sedation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're dealing with people who have post-traumatic stress disorder, um, even end of life, those kinds of issues, agitation, anxiety, play a huge role in that. Yeah. And, and what kind of medication is currently being prescribed for them? Um, opioids, there's, you know, uh, which carry um, a host of negative consequences, including, you know, death by overdose. Mm -hmm. um, that is not one of the side effects of cannabis. Um, you know, like I said, the, the, the worst side effect in my review of the literature was sedation. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, side effect does not equal negative side effect. Mm -hmm. right. And so, um, you know, the, the, the body heals itself the most when it's sleeping. Right. And so if we have something that can naturally induce that state, it can help a lot. It can help a lot. Mr. Wolsifer. Yes. So you are running for state for Florida Attorney General. Yes, indeed I am. Okay, what exactly does the Attorney General do? Well, the, the Chief Legal Officer of the state is mm -hmm. responsible for overseeing uh, criminal appeals, consumer protection, controlled substance list variations, uh, a whole variety of things. Okay. A whole variety of things. It's and huge. In fact, sits on the clemency board, mm -hmm. uh, head of the uh, cumulatively with the other cabinet members, head of Veteran Affairs, Department of Motor Vehicles. Okay. So it's a very large position, over 1,300 okay. employees. Well, we don't really hear much about uh, political officials running with a cannabis platform. Um, can you tell me how exactly you came to be in favor and supportive of medical cannabis? Absolutely. Um, it was uh, by, by happenstance, so to say. Um, I was with the Libertarian Party. Remember the Libertarian Party, and they've advocated for end of prohibition since 1972. Wow. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. They've been consistent. Uh, same thing with same-sex marriage and a lot of laws that are now finally coming to mainstream uh -huh. discussion. The Libertarian Party's been there since 1972, wow. uh, unequivocally. But uh, what happened with me is my wife called me out to watch a 60-minute segment that many people have seen to show what was going on in Colorado, and I says, "Well, we." We can do better here in Florida. Mm -hmm. I was aware of the uh, the joint resolution that uh, Senator Clements had uh, introduced, okay. and thought I could draft a a good bill. Uh, so I did. Uh, I did so voluntarily, without pay. I wrote the what came to be known as the Kathy Jordan Medical Cannabis Act, and I've been uh, advocating since. That was uh, late 2012. What happened with that act? It was introduced by Senator Clements in 2013, and Katie Edwards, Representative Edwards, mm -hmm. in the House. It was in both the uh, House and Senate chambers, picked up uh, four or five House sponsors mm -hmm. in 2013. It was uh, reintroduced in 2014, and it, uh, it stagnated in committee both years. Mm -hmm. Now, is it true that the U.S. government has a patent on medical marijuana? It is true. <laughs> and despite that patent, um, it still remains a Schedule One drug in the Florida statutes? Is that right? And in the federal statute. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah, that's not, you can't reconcile that. 
Okay, and can you <laughs> explain to the viewers exactly what it means to be a, a Schedule One? Well, it means that the drug is uh, not believed to have any scientific value and is subject to abuse. Okay. And our Attorney General has uh, fallen down on the job with regard to moving uh, cannabis, low-level THC cannabis from Schedule One, because once SB 1030 was passed, and we now have what's commonly referred to as a Charlotte's Web Bill, a CBD bill, which finds there is medicinal value in cannabis, right. we've got to get it off Schedule One. Right. We can't have both at the same time, and that's why the Attorney General has the authority, the statutory authority under uh, 893.0355 to make those moves to reschedule uh, unilaterally through rule promulgation, uh, as opposed to waiting for a deliberative body like the legislator to do it. Wow. So if you were elected to Attorney General, mm -hmm. you could yourself change that from a Schedule One. Yes, I believe it would be a delegation of duty at this point with the CBD bill in place to not do that, okay. to move it down to, say, Schedule 2. Wow. And so that would be for on the state level? Yes. And it would remain as the federal government wants to do it on the federal level. Is that right? Well, the state doesn't control what the federal government does, but we do okay. have some say in how we respond to it. Okay. And again, the Attorney General under uh, Section 16.52 has a duty to uh, negate encroachment on state rights by the federal government. I contend that there is nothing in our Constitution that gives the federal government a right to impose a controlled substance list on the 50 states. Okay. I don't know why we would need 51. If theirs is the only one that matters, we don't need the other 50. Yeah. So um, I, I would challenge the federal uh, government's oversight on that as well. All right, you mentioned Charlotte's Web, the Charlotte's Web bill. Can you, what exactly is that? I mean, does that mean that we Floridians already have medical marijuana and don't need any other legislation to that effect? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we may already have medical marijuana under the medical necessity of defense and under the Jenks Law mm -hmm. and other uh, series of um, decisions. But uh, SB 1030, the Charlotte's Web Bill, as it's referred to, and probably not properly referred that way, which is a, a trademark name, uh, is a, uh, a CBD bill, which, uh, which a low, low level of THC and a higher level of CBD. Uh, it does have cannabis in it. It does have some level of THC for human consumption, which is, again, why we need to move it off of Schedule 1. But it is not for, for smoking or for vaporizing or for edibles. And it's, it's really just for uh, those who benefit from that, uh, uh, from the uh, cannabidiol. And so it, is it limited to certain specific ailments or? Yeah, the focus of this bill was for uh, persons who suffer with uh, intractable epilepsy, okay. which is believed to be uh, about 125,000, mostly children in our state. Wow. So it's good. You know, it's a move in the right direction. Uh -huh. Is there any way that we as voters this November can try and make a positive change? Well, absolutely. We have a constitutional amendment, too, on the ballot. Okay. Uh, there is a chance to... Uh, there's a chance to move further in the direction we should go for medical access uh, for cannabis for patients who need it. And I, and I said that a little bit hesitantly because I don't think it goes far enough. Okay. Uh, but I also believe that as the uh, whole includes the lesser, that with Amendment 2, I don't think SB 1030 is going to have much operation. Okay. Because uh, it's encompassed in, in the larger uh, constitutional amendment if it passes. Well, I have heard, though, people a little bit concerned that if Amendment 2 passes, that a pot shop's going to open up on every corner. Do we have anything that can alleviate that fear, or is that true? Is that going to happen? Well, first of all, I don't know what a pot shop is okay. and if it's something to be feared. Okay. Uh, but it does bring a good question about, and that is, as Amendment 2 is written, um, it's subject to various interpretations. One of those interpretations will be whether or not municipalities could control uh, access within their city or county. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Naples has already passed a law, I believe they have, that says we're not going to have what that public fair pot shops are. And I believe Bonita Springs is uh, discussing a law in other communities as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I suspect the state is going to say you can't do that, just like they did on uh, Amendment 2 rights. It's a statewide uh, allowance under the constitutional amendment. But uh, that will play out locally and statewide. Okay. Yeah. Now, what kind of economic impact might cannabis have if Amendment 2 passes? I don't think it'll be as huge as what we see in Colorado, okay. but it'll be going in that direction. Well, much of that, the answer to that question relies on the rules that are promulgated by the Department of Health. 
because the amendment gives us the framework and it really dumps it on the Department of Health to shape its rollout and, it's in, in, and the way it will be applied across the state. Uh, they were highly restrictive under SB 1030, mm -hmm. so it's a possibility that we have this here, uh, what some might see as a, a great opportunity for the economy, uh, mm -hmm. a cash crop, or a way to get safe uh, medicine, not to patients who need it, right. and yet we don't have access, like right. New Jersey, where yeah, it's available, you just can't get it. Right. It's legal, don't expect to get any. Right. Uh, so the potential is there, the economic impact is, is absolutely there. In Colorado, they're discussing giving money back to the taxpayers. We haven't had that problem in Florida. Now, here in Apalachicola and Franklin County, we've got a lot of concerns about water. And um, looking into your materials and your platform, it, it seems like you recognize more value to the cannabis plant than just the medical marijuana, um, that it also is available as a source for all kinds of products in the form of hemp, right. and that that may somehow be able to play into um, alleviating our water difficulties? Well, uh, we refer to that as hemp for water. Okay. And, and that's sort of a, a, a convoluted plan. Okay. Uh, and, and there's more to it than that. Uh, we also have the problem uh, stemming up in uh, North Georgia from Lake Lanier, uh, which is restricting the flow of water down to this community here. And we also have our current Attorney General fighting against uh, cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay a thousand miles from here. So okay. I think that... Uh, the focus needs to be uh, tweaked at the Attorney General's office back to Florida. But to answer your question, industrial hemp is a great cash crop, and I have no problem calling that a cash crop. Uh, it, our nation was built uh, with hemp as, as a staple crop for our economy. Uh, we brought it back in during World War II with the Hemp for Victory campaign because those were difficult times. Mm -hmm. uh, so we turned to uh, logical, sensible resources. Right. <laughs> But uh, the, the hemp is prohibited because it competes with fossil fuels and wood and paper and other products. Plastics. Plastics, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And really just about anything. <laughs> it's an incredible product that uh, can be used uh, on multiple markets and is used in, uh, throughout multiple industries and markets right here in Florida. Is it possible to regulate it? Or, I mean, what would, what's your proposal in terms of getting hemp back into the market? Well, I, as Attorney General, I would remove it from the controlled substance list entirely. Okay. Uh, for is it on purposes. the controlled substance list in, on the federal level? It is indeed. It's number okay. one all the way wow. across. Yeah. So even in states where we have it, um, like Kentucky, mm -hmm. it now has uh, industrial hemp use in their state, but that's only for university research. And that's a good start. Can industrial hemp get you high? Does it have the euphoric effect? No. Okay. None of it? No. And I also want to state that the United States of America is the largest importer currently of hemp products, and yet we can't grow and manufacture our own hemp products because when the prohibition movement came around, mm -hmm. they lumped hemp in with cannabis and just got it all prohibited. So who produces the hemp that we use here in the United States? Canada, largely. Okay. 30 industrial countries. Wow. But uh, Canada, Mexico are our main sources, then China. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that could be a big economic boom for us if we could Absolutely. open our doors we to it. Absolutely. We have vacant farmland formerly with tobacco and cotton and citrus. That's just waiting for a, a, an agricultural product like this. Wow. It's so frustrating. <laughs> I hope that we're able to get something done about it. I think especially in economically disadvantaged areas like us here in Franklin County, okay. Um, you know, uh, it could be huge. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the panhandle, mm -hmm. much of the panhandle. So that's wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for talking to us and coming out here. Thank you, Mr. Wolsifer, for coming all thank the way to Tallahassee. And thank you, Ms. Bell. Um, and if, so if I have one last thing to sure, say, go ahead. I would like to remind everybody to please get out there and vote yes on Amendment 2. We have an excellent start here um, with what we've got going on with the SB 1030. But like Mr. Wilsifer said, I don't believe that it goes far enough. Um, it's only scratching the surface. And um, our voices are loud, and we can be powerful, but we need to get out there and exercise our vote. Good. Thank you all. Thank you.
Thank you all for watching today. We want to thank our guests, Bill Wolsifer, Josephine Krell, and Annalise Clark. And we hope you all get registered and get out the vote this November.